You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? The brother did. The brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you want to talk about death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just a murdery thingy 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 thingy. Oh my god. Oh my, oh my god. Relax. 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 Go to it. When you want to get to it. Remember? No. From Zoolander? <laughs> remember? <laughs> don't you remember? No, I've never seen Zoolander. Oh, okay. Then no, you don't. Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy. I'm Chloe. I'm Mario. Welcome to our podcast. So, what are we doing this week? We are doing some Midwestern mystery murderies. Yay. Yeah, yours is also murdery? Yes, mine's also very murdery. All right, nice, nice, nice. Yep, yep, because the Midwest is riddled with bodies. Well, I... And we're going to oh. talk about it. <laughs> the Midwest is riddled with bodies, and uh, <laughs> here we are to discuss it. <laughs> yep, this is the roundup. The Midwestern That's body it. count That's the podcast. roundup. <laughs> you could probably make a whole podcast of just Midwestern murder mysteries. There are. There are probably multiple ones. Um, there are books. I've I've run across a few of them. It's crazy. Yeah, it's really crazy how grisly these small towns yeah, can get. Uh, it's true. And I specifically chose Indiana because the minute you were like, "Let's do some like Midwest like small town murders," I was like, "Oh, oh, I'm going to Indiana." <laughs> Indiana crazy. Indiana's got some fucked up shit. Indiana's got a lot. Mississippi of the Midwest, y'all. Well, I've been thinking about doing, I don't know if it's Delphi or Delphi, I don't know how to say it, um, but it's a town, I believe, in Indiana um, where these two girls were killed, but it's too recent. Okay. I think it's too recent. Let it marinate. Yeah, it needs to, yeah. There's still, like, fresh articles coming out about it. That's how I feel about certain things that are in the news, have been in the news the past, you know, a little while. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fu- possible future talk. I know! Yeah. Mario, we're the same. Okay. Let's warm up. <laughs> that's how you warm up, right? Okay, don't look at my my screen. Okay, I can't take my glasses off, though. Because I know. I'm wearing contacts yeah. right now. <laughs> you know how, like... You know how, like, when you take off, no, maybe you don't understand this. You know how when you take off the collar of a dog and they're, like, naked? Is that my face right now to you? Yeah, when you're, like, clean shaven and don't have glasses on, it's, like, the equivalent to taking the collar off of a dog. Well, I appreciate being you're um, stray. compared to a dog, so thank Well, you. every time we see a dog, you like to mention that I have a dog name, right? Well, you do, so... <laughs> I mean, I didn't decide that. The writers at DreamWorks or whatever decided it. So. No, and, like, the world. I, like, so. tell my mom, and I'm like, Mom, you gave me a dog name. And she's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, yes. I met so many dogs named Chloe, and I'm like, that's nice. Yep. If your dog is named Chloe, email us a picture. He named you after the dog. Or just, like, email us pictures of your dogs anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, mystery murder everything at gmail.com. Okay, we're like way off topic here. All right, let's... Getting off the topic, off of it, off of the topic. Are you like, I feel like... What? If this was a radio show, we like wouldn't need like little like <laughs> things because it would just be you. Yeah. I just had a list. Dude, I can be the, the Foley artist. Yeah. With, but with, with, with my voice, your voice. Mostly. And a little glockenspiel. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Ding. That's your only <laughs> wah, wah. That was good. Okay. Th- but seriously, this is actually, like, very Yeah, this grisly. is like a really serious This is episode. a very serious episode. Um, We say that every fucking episode, Mario. Almost. We say that every episode. Almost every episode. Um, So. Let's talk about what happened in 1977 in Henryville, Indiana. So this is like one of those. What, sorry. <laughs> this is like one of those. Mario's like shoving this microphone in my face. I'm like, get it away. I just wanted to pick up your voice properly. I know. I appreciate that. 
I'm always very nervous about the sound. I don't know why, because we said from the very beginning, like, yeah. this is not about that, okay? <laughs> Just chill. It's lo-fi. We're, like, we, like, we're sitting here, like, eating chips, like, <laughs> not talking, ab- talking about murder. True. I mean, we were eating chips, but when we will continue to re- eat chips after this is over. True. At least I will. I believe you will, too. Now I'm going to go to a, a restaurant. Are you going to go to... Nope, we're not talking about this now. <laughs> I definitely could have, like, launched we're into that. We're also recording this early, so I probably will be editing. Yeah, you could take some of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, like, keep in, like, Should I just our, like, genuine... Here? Yes. Okay. I, keep in our, like, genuine cute moments, because we're cute as hell. And that's right? part of the charm. We should do, like, a survey... And one of the questions should be, are we cute as hell? And then the two poll answers are yes and yes. Right. Team mystery. But there would be other questions, too. Not okay. just Not just that. Okay. Let's do this. Okay. We're moving on. Yes. Um, okay. Henryville, Indiana, 1977. So, like I said, kind of I hadn't heard this term before, but I like it. A one stoplight kind of town. Like, there's mm-hmm. only one stoplight in the whole town. Um It currently has a population of about 1,900 people, but this is the 70s, and that was the 2010 census, and I couldn't really find much about it because it's a small town. Um, So I estimated about 1,500 people at the time, let's say. So in the all in the same year, three boys were found murdered, sexually assaulted, um, and they never found out who did them. There are still no arrests. It's an open case. So the first boy was found April 28th, Richard Lee Sweeney. He was only eight years old. Um, And he was found in the loft of a barn called the Blue Lick Auction Barn. And he was covered in rags and clothes. Um, His hands were tied. He was sexually assaulted. And he was strangled. Um, And he died around 11 a.m. that that day that we see. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. They, like, found his body and everything. June 10th, they found another body. So this is a couple months later. Jeffrey Allen Burkett, age 15 or 16, we don't really know. He was found by two mountain bikers in the Clark State Forest. His hands were also wrapped. They were wrapped in wire. They were tied above his head, and he was also sexually assaulted. He had a skull fracture, but the cause of death was asphyxiation. So, um, and there's also evidence that, like, his body was dragged into the, like, dragged for quite some time. So, um, uh, they also think that he was, uh, could have been strangled as well. Maybe in a different location and then the yes. body was moved or something. Yes, all of these, all, there's three, all of them were found within a five mile radius of each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the next was September 27th. Donald M. Abel, age 19. Um, He was missing, actually missing for two weeks before he was found um, October 9th. So he was found near the same forest um, that Jeffrey Allen Burkett was found in. uh, And his hands were bound, he was beaten, and his shoes were missing. And they determined that he died of a skull fracture. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of rumors with this case. And there were very, I got, I had very little sources. My sources were Reddit and Web Sleuths. Mm -hmm. Like no official like newspaper articles because they were all archived and stuff like that. Like it was very, I don't know, this, it's a very creepy case because like, Everybody seems so quiet about it and very tight-lipped, and everybody mm-hmm. seems to kind of want to bury it. That's just the kind mm-hmm. of vibe that I got. Like someone knows something, but they're not willing to come forward. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was rumored that uh, Donald was riding a bike at the time, but his bike was never found. Um, so the big thing about this case is why... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think that's always the question. Yeah. Um, why this was never solved uh the burkett case had a strong suspect but uh uh he quickly moved to florida shortly after the murders he like got out of dodge Hmm. then there's talk that there is a suspect who 
was linked to all three. But then he died. And then uh, there was also somebody who was said to have been um, or had the last name Stargle. Um, also, there was people were suspicious about a doctor who lived in town um, that people had bad relations with. So there's all. Why is there always like a creepy doctor in the mix? <laughs> right. I like, don't know. <laughs> so many murder mysteries. It's like. There was also this weird doctor, and he could have done it, you know? I think it's The because wounds were very precise. At, well, there was rumors that um, the third victim, um, Donald, was, like, pricked and stuff and had, like, um, shallow, like, stab wounds. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, it wasn't really anything ever concrete or right. Con confirmed. right. On, on any of them it was it was all like kind of fuzzy yeah um so the police department won't release any information either only that the cases are still open so yeah like Weird. i said small town tight-lipped people a someone knows something type of deal mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's been 40 years 40 years i believe 41, 41, 42. Sorry, math, <laughs> math, math. It's a bitch. That was good. I was, I was just trying to do something they do in Family Guy, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> men. We don't know what we did. <laughs> right. Oh my god. We don't know what we did. <laughs> Fucking Family Guy. People always talk about how, like, Family Guy is going downhill, but I never understood that, and I don't think I understand that with most television shows in general. Yeah. Supernatural. <laughs> oh, uh. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm. The second murders are the Burger Chef murders. Okay, you said this one was really crazy, right? Yeah, this one is sad. So, this happened... In 1978, a year after what happened in Henryville, happened in Speedway, Indiana. So bigger population, about 12,600, uh, but uh, still pretty small. Home to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which right. I read was has been there since like 1909 or something like mm -hmm. that. Like 100 years. And um, in, so a lot of... There were multiple things happening during in in like Speedway, Indiana during this time. Um, so in July of that year, a 65 year old woman was shot and killed by someone in her own garage. And then in September, there was eight random soda can bombings in what? six days in the span of six days and left two people injured. What's a soda can bombing? Improvised explosive devices placed in trash bins around the town. Oh, that's weird. So it the like damage was minor. Nobody uh, huh. was really injured. Um, I'm straight up reading oh, this okay. from like the the Wikipedia. It sounds like they page. were kind of like flashbangs, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And, yeah, this guy named Kimberlin. Brett Kimberlin was arrested. Sounds he like sounds, a dick. He sounds like a dick. <laughs> Brett Kimberlin. <laughs> Brett. Here to scare you. Soda can bombs. Um, and, yeah, so he was he was actually a local musician um, and a political activist. Quote, unquote. Okay. Um, so, the murders. It's a Friday night. On, I'm not really. no <laughs> on November 17th, 1978, four employees are scheduled to close up the local Burger Chef. So Burger Chef, think like um, McDonald's, Wendy's, McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. 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 <laughs> <laughs> One black coffee, same motherfucker. <laughs> if you know, you know. All right, moving on. <laughs> um. So, yeah, it's a Friday night, and these four employees are scheduled to close up the local burger chef 
which was bought by Hardee's. It, be, it like basically became Hardee's. Okay. In 1982. So, 12.15 a.m. that Saturday, November 18th, which, note, side note, November 18th, 1978 is the day, um, uh, Jonestown, the Jonestown massacre happened. Oh shit! So weird. Yeah, weird vibes. Yeah. Weird vibes. Um, so their newspaper that day was pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, an empl- an off duty employee um, walks by and sees that the back door is open at the th- and that the restaurant's totally empty. So we find that Daniel Davis, sixteen; Ruth Shelton, seventeen; assistant manager Jane Freed. Uh, 20 and Mark Flemons 16 are missing. Those were the people who were working that night. They're gone. Um, and $581 in cash from the register is also missing. But it's kind of, it's a weird situation. There are no signs of struggle. There was no um, change taken from the register which had like hundreds of dollars of change. Hmm. Um, the like automated ones. Mm-hmm. And uh, two they found... Um, Two women's purses who were most likely um, belonged to Ruth and Jane. Um, and then I lost where I was. And some of the employees' jackets were missing. Uh, Jane Freed, the assistant manager, her 1974 Chevy Vega was also missing. So it was actually later found that morning and that's when the investigators started looking into it as a kidnapping because the immediate theory was that the four took the money and went out for a joy ride okay sure. it was like some petty theft and they that's what they wrote it off as uh-huh. and so that saturday morning the employees cleaned up the place and opened up shop uh-huh. yeah it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't processed as a as murder a crime scene or anything wow. no, not at all because they didn't think it Right. It was. Um, so then the abandoned car is found, and they're like, you know, something's up here. The next day, a Sunday afternoon, hikers find the bodies of the four. Um, they were 20 miles away in the rural woods of Johnson County. So both Davis and Shelton had been shot execution style numerous times, and they were found laying next to each other face down. Uh uh, and it was later determined that they were shot with a 38 caliber firearm. Uh, Freed had been stabbed twice in the chest. Uh, and, like, they found the knife, like, in her chest when they got there. Like, yeah, like, oh my God. like Hollywood movie type shit. Yeah. The handle of the knife had broken off and it was never found. But the blade was recovered. Yeah. And wow. we will touch on that later. Uh, Flemons. He, this, he... <laughs> He suffered a blunt force head injury, but it was okay. So it was later determined that he was bludgeoned with some sort of chain before he died. And the actual cause of death was asphyxiation because the coroner say that he died choking on his own blood. Mm-hmm. So he, um, I, I read a lot that he fled, he like tried to run um, only to have the misfortune of colliding with something heavy, possibly a tree. Oh, okay. And he's out. Yeah. And then he chokes on his own blood. Mm-hmm. It's pretty fucked. Yeah. And they were also wearing their uniforms when they were found. So <sighs> something, who knows oh what God. happened. It's very, it's very bizarre because they're, they were all killed in such different ways, which leads me to think that, and a lot of other people think that there's multiple suspects here Mm -hmm. um so the fbi the indiana state police and the indianapolis police department and the marion county sheriff's department were called in to assist so this is the investigation it wasn't great from the start like i said they found the bodies two days later um and the initial crime scene like i said was clean so there's like no Mm -hmm. tangible evidence uh, Burger Chef headquarters at the time offered a twenty five thousand dollar reward, which in nineteen seventy eight was like ninety six thousand dollars or yeah, something like that. It's like a legit amount of money. It was like yeah, a lot of money. Leading um, so any information leading to an arrest and award of twenty five grand, and then an, an anonymous donor offered ten grand. There was 
a witness. So the witness was a 16-year-old. And, I mean, you know how we feel about... Um, Eyewitness testimony. Yeah, yeah. It is very often... Well, it is almost always flawed in some way. And it is, it is often fatally flawed, critically flawed Not in great. some way. Not great. Yeah. Um, so he's 16 years old. He saw two men skulking around the area right before closing... One was bearded, and one was clean-shaven and had light hair. There were clay busts made off of this eyewitness account. Yeah, yes. they used to do this all the time. Um, however, there was this guy who was linked via those those busts. Someone looked at it and was like, oh, this looks like this guy, mm-hmm. um, who allegedly also was bragging about the murders. Okay. So the, de- so the detective of the sheriff's office... Um, Virgil Vandegrift, he goes undercover and he talks to this guy who didn't confess, but almost confessed. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was, but when he was questioned by police, like actually brought in, he denied everything. He passed a polygraph test, which doesn't really mean anything, but back then it did. Um, and there was no evidence. There was no evidence against him. So we don't know. The main theory is that it was a robbery gone bad and that maybe someone put up a fight or maybe they knew each other somebody was recognized um which is possible in this town small town uh maybe some of the employee there's rumors that some of maybe one or two of them were selling drugs and it went sour um in so the 40 year anniversary november of 2018 this past november they released a photo of the blade found in Jane Freed's chest hoping to jog someone's memory but you know yeah the case is still open yeah and those are my that's crazy small town merdares cool um so my sources uh the Burger Chef Murders Wikipedia page an article from Indianapolis Monthly by Tony Rehagen this was a really good article um an article on the website of a radio station in Indiana, WIBC, by Chris W-I-B-C. Davis. WIBC. This is Chris Davis. There's not signing much on. going on in Indiana, you know. Indianapolis Star article by Will Higgins and Reddit and Web Sleuths. Nice. That's it. Cool. Good deal. Your turn. Good shit. Your no, turn. I mean not good. Good, good cuz it's murder, but you know, what Terrible. I mean. You you're speaking about it well. Um, and you may or may not do a part two of these murder mysteries. You might do something else, but I'm definitely going to do two parts of the Midwestern murder mysteries because there's, there's a lot. Uh, I'm going to start out though with, uh, the disappearance and, and probable murder of Sarah Bushland and the definite murder of Crystal Solier. And we'll see that they're, they're kind of linked. So Sarah Bushland was a 15-year-old sophomore at Spooner City High when she went missing on April 3rd of 1996 from Spooner, Wisconsin, which you'll recall from our last episode, Spooner, Wisconsin. Oh. The small town of Spooner. Is that a coincidence? uh, It's just a coincidence, kind of. I mean, I saw the article on the Spooner Advocate site, so it's not too much of a coincidence, but yeah. Um, So, like I said, Sarah, she was a a new sophomore, actually, at Spooner City High because she had moved to the area about 16 months earlier from Colorado due to her parents' divorce Mm. and her mom's remarrying uh, Jim Lambert, who lived there in in Spooner. And in that uh, time period, the little bit over a year that she had been there in Wisconsin, Sarah had kind of fallen in with a bad crowd, let's say, an older crowd. And uh, she had really kind of pissed off her parents when she started dating a 21-year-old guy. How old is she again? 15. 15? Ooh. Whom she was for bad to see until she turned 16 that August. Mm. But this is still April. So she um, was also grounded until Easter of 1996. So she still had a couple of weeks to go um, to where she wasn't supposed to, you know, go out and have fun and that kind of stuff. So on the... um, Last day that she was seen, April 3rd, 1996, her parents um, were both out of town for the night um, when she got home from school. Her father, stepfather Jim, was with a friend from Canada in Stillwater, Minnesota, 
Marie Lambert was at a funeral in Chippewa Falls. And here's what happened next, according to the Charlie Project website, mm. which is a, a website that right. tracks these sort of things. Quote, Sarah was, seen, was last seen after exiting her school bus at the end of the driveway of her family's residence on April 3rd, 1996, in rural Spooner, Wisconsin. She was about 100 yards from her house. There was a dark-colored pickup truck driving behind the bus, and when she got out, it pulled up next to her, and she spoke to the driver, then got inside the vehicle. The truck backed out of Sarah's driveway and started off in the direction of the nearby town of Trago. Sarah has never been heard from again. Close quote. Yeah, so that's basically what, what? happened. So very, very that's, mysterious. Oh, that makes, oh, it's spooky. Yeah, and, and this, you know, again, eyewitness testimony, not perfect, but this was confirmed by, like, three eyewitnesses on the bus. And according to um, Sarah's sister, Leslie Small, her case wasn't, quote, taken seriously for three years, close quote. Um, for example, the property around Sarah's home wasn't searched until 1999. And they didn't really even consider it to be a missing person's case for, like, two or three years. Oh, my God. It was labeled, you know, as a runaway case, as often happens in these types but of cases. On. <laughs> when so often they are not runaway, they are made to disappear by terrible people. Um, there were also more searches done subsequently in... Uh, August of 2000, May of 2013, and most recently June of 2017. Oh, wow. But nothing has ever come of any of these uh, searches on, on and around the Lambert property. Um, Sarah did not take any money or clothes with her, and there were no reports of her acting strangely that day. Um, she must have known this person. That's what it definitely seems like. Um, now, of course, the there's also this matter of the ex-boyfriend, right? Obviously, this is kind of the first place to, to which you would go, right? That, that you would think. Um, so Sarah and her ex-boyfriend had lunch the day of the disappearance. And he told police and Sarah's mom, who went over there, you know, to check, see if she was there. Um, that's the time, last time he said that he saw her, was, was when they had lunch together that day. And then he drove her back to school. The family thinks that the mysterious driver of the pickup truck, as you said, must have been someone known to Sarah. And amateur and professional sleuths think that Sarah's mysterious disappearance may not be an isolated incident. Crystal Solier, as I mentioned yeah. earlier, um, her disappearance may also, and murder may also be linked to this. So, uh, Crystal was last seen at, uh, at the age of 18 in Cable, Wisconsin, nearby, uh, a couple of counties over. In um, October of 1996, okay, so about so six same, months later. Same year, yeah. Same uh, year, about six months later. And she was uh, dropped off for work on October 1st of 1996, but found out she didn't need to be there, so then she needed to leave. She was reportedly arguing with her boyfriend in the parking lot of her work uh, that someone kind of saw that happening, right? And then uh, got a ride home, uh, for, or got a ride, rather, from a uh, work acquaintance. And it's kind of weird at this point um, that she started seemingly heading to her grandma's place for some reason, but it's not really clear why. Um, her grandma lives in Beloit, or lived in Beloit, um, and her uh, grandma, Crystal's grandma, got a strange call from, from Crystal uh, a little while after she had left her work. Uh, Crystal was taking the bus and didn't want to wait for a long layover to, to get to Beloit. So she asked if her grandma could come pick her up. But before Crystal could say exactly where she was, the call was abruptly cut off. And neither her grandma nor anyone else that we know of saw Crystal ever again. Oh my god. Alive. These Chris are so spooky though, like straight I know. up somebody disappeared, just vanished. Oh. Oh. Um so Crystal didn't vanish forever, though. Her body was found oh, no. in Rock County, Wisconsin, about five months after her disappearance, but it was not I identified for about another six years oh, until wow. 2002. Wow. Reportedly, the police had Crystal's dental records filed incorrectly, oh, God. and so oh, they didn't God. find them when they were doing their search of missing persons. So it didn't. It it fell to her sister. Uh, and her own kind of pursuit of the truth 
to um, when, when she actually saw a reconstruction, like the one you were talking about earlier, in clay and everything. Yeah. And was like, I think that's my sister. Went to the police and kind of took it from there. So, yeah, let's unpack a little bit of the, the victimology here, right? Because that's that's what, what kind of strongly links these two cases. Crystal and Sarah were similar, very similar in some respects. They were both young. They were both women. They were both blonde. Um and they ran with the same crowd. Mm. They were also both initially dismissed as quote unquote runaways, runaways. right? Yep. So they knew each other through at least nineteen mutual friends. Uh, one of these mutual friends happened to be Crystal's younger sister, Freedom Solier, who also happened to be Sarah's best friend. So oh. yeah, there's like a strong link between them, and they both also frequented parties held by a group of men in their early 20s. Most of the aforementioned 19 mutual friends oh, were these yeah. these men. And some people think that there was kind of a rivalry between two groups that, that you know, some of these men were part of, and that Crystal and Sarah may have been kind of caught up in something, oh, right? No. Something bigger than themselves. That's, uh... One writer in my sources compared it to, like, a kind of a, a gang kind of situation, you know, and they, but they don't know for sure. They don't know for sure, but, but that Crystal and Sarah were kind of associated with members of both groups. And so maybe they got caught in the middle, but we don't really know. So this whole thing, right, where Sarah would go out and, and drink and hang out with these older guys, this was also kind of a secret double life, apparently, as none of Sarah's school chums professed to be chums. aware of her escapades. Wow. So um, none of the men also that I mentioned a little while ago were, were named as a suspect in either crime either. Just just to be clear, none of them was even ever, like, you know, investigated seriously. They didn't seem to have anything to do with it, um, according to police at least. Uh, so, so for now, these cases remain, you know, very, very cold. Um, mm. But, you know, it, it, there is, you know, at least some kind of hope people bring these up again. You know, like you were saying, maybe someone knows something. You know, maybe yeah. they'll come forward. And um, Sarah Bushland's father, Mike Bushland, um, when he was interviewed in 2013, said something kind of to that, to that effect. He said, quote, I'm sure somebody knows what happened to Sarah. Somebody knows. Uh... Quote, unquote, he said. Um, so, yeah, that's um, very disturbing. That that's what that was the story that kind of got me interested in looking into the, the Midwestern murder mysteries. Because... Um, I think it was the the sister, Freedom Solier, I think was the one the article was about her kind of like trying to bring these cases up again, you know, trying to reinvestigate to some extent. Okay, so my next one is a little bit different. It's uh, the case of um, the murder of Big Jim Colosimo. Oh, okay, okay. Also known as Giacomo Vincenzo Colosimo, Big Jim, and Diamond Jim. Which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Diamond, Diamond Jim. Jim. Why he's named, known as Diamond Jim. So he was an immigrant from Calabria, Italy to Chicago. Nice. Um, Big Jim came to Chicago at the tender age of 17. Um, he was not very tender, though. Uh, he, uh, he gained the attention of some local political bosses. Um, again, Chicago's always had a, a pretty rough political scene, um, especially back, fuck, back then. Um, who kind of brought him under their wing, right? So he paid his dues basically by committing petty crimes, you know, doing kind oh, of the, yeah. the street work of these sort of like political criminal enterprises as they were. And uh, Big Jim eventually became Diamond Jim. When <laughs> upgrade. He's, upgrade. Moving on up. <laughs> when he started dressing very flashy in a white suit with diamond rings Ooh. and other jewels and such that he got from his Ill, ill-begotten funds of his criminal doings. Yikes. And uh, apparently he was very good at this because he, he worked his way up. The American dream, right? Wow. Work your, work your way up. Through the mafia? Okay, maybe not exactly that. But anyway, he was <laughs> quite successful and he, he did eventually become... Uh, the uh, enthusiastic owner and runner of approximately 200 brothels in and oh, around wow. the city of Chicago. Wow! So he was making bang. Yes, he he was uh he was he was getting rich off the oldest profession. Let's say yes. Yeah. 
And, and apparently he was quite fond of wine and women and uh, being a, a pimp um, to, to, in the parlance of, of, of the times of a different era. Um, so he also eventually became an early Italian-American mafia crime boss as well. Uh, so <laughs> he was doing pretty well. And his network became known as the Chicago Outfit right, um, after okay. his right. uh, untimely, let's say, death, so uh, to speak. Could have had a better name, but uh, okay. <laughs> right. All right. It, and it, st- it, it uh, was known and maybe still even is known as the Chicago Outfit. It was, it was a lasting, as we'll see, uh, organization. And the Chicago Outfit, they ran, you know, sex work, racketing, gambling uh, from about under the tutelage of Big Jim, 1902 to 1920. So a long time, uh, almost 20 years, yeah. he was in charge of this organization. And eventually, though, Big Jim's, Diamond Jim's big mistake may have been uh. bringing in John the Fox Torio from Brooklyn to be his second in command. Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. You know, the Fox. <laughs> John Torio. He was supposed to provide muscle you know, um, kind of a security mm. to, to, to Big Jim's enterprise. Things were getting a little more rougher. Right-hand man. You know, and um, this, though, may have been his undoing, though, because John Torrio may have betrayed mm. Big Jim Colosimo, as we'll see. So Torrio, who also brought in a young Al Capone to become a bartender and bouncer at a new brothel... Ah! Just down the road from ah. Big Jim's restaurant and club on South Wabash. <laughs> All uh, right. Right? Um, well, that'll come into play in a little bit. In 1920, a lot of turmoil was brought to the criminal elements, not only in Chicago, but especially in Chicago, as prohibition was instituted mm-hmm. against alcohol, of course. And um, Torrio essentially wanted to bootleg, right, to continue those funds flowing. And Big Jim disagreed. He said, no, we're not going to do that. So, here's a quote from Wikipedia. Quote, In May 1920, Colosimo left Chicago to marry his second wife, Dale Winter, having deserted Victoria Moresco. Quote, unquote, his first wife. Uh, When he returned a week later, Torrio called and told uh, uh, him a shipment was about to arrive at his cafe. Uh. Colosimo drove there to await it, but... Instead, he was shot <gasps> in an ambush and killed. Oh my Close god! Quote. Yes, this is classic. Ring, ring, bitch! There's a mafia, package. Yes, yeah. uh, activity. You know, this is it's it's as Hollywood as you can get. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that this was something Mario Puzo was well aware of, right? And this story has been used specifically in certain um, media la- later on. Um, so anyway, he was reportedly, quote, slain by a single bullet fired from a cloakroom, close quote, by whom we do not know. Um, his new wife, Dale, was initially suspected, but was quickly ruled out. No one was ever charged for the murder. It's suspected that Torrio bumped off Big Jim so as to better be able to bootleg, of course. Al Capone has been rumored to be the trigger man. And been bringing oh, up Al Capone back nuts. into it, or Frankie Yale, who was a Torrio associate from New York, Giovanni Colosimo, who at first organized the crime families of Chicago, was eventually replaced by Torrio, who may have been his killer, and then Capone, but his murder was never solved. His visage and story, though, have, like I said, periodically popped up in pop culture. Um, From the 1930s, soon after his death, all the way until uh, more modern day, such as in 2010, when it was featured in the first episode of Boardwalk Empire. Oh, wow. So it's definitely still a a famous salient story in our culture. I mean, it's so classic. It's very classic. I had never really heard of it before, but apparently he was one of the biggest. Well, there's a lot. Uh, (laughs) There's so many. And that's why we do this podcast. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to do one last Midwestern murder for this week, and then I'm going to get into some kind of biggies for next week. They're, the Next week's going to be more murdery for me. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not going to get any bl- less bloody from here. So, uh, But I'm going to do first the killing of Sharon Tyndale. Uh, Sharon Tyndale was the Illinois Secretary of State from 1865 to 1869. Getting a little retro here. 
uh, taking a, a dip back into a, a shortly post bellum America. So two years after his term ended, is that post bellum? The 1865? That's right after I, the Civil I War, right? I am not the person to Pretty ask. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Two years after his... You said 1865 to 1869. I think that's right after the Civil War. Pretty sure it was 1861 to 1865. Anyway, two years after Sharon's term had ended, he was shot by an unknown killer right outside his home. Oh my so god. So let's get into it. Sharon's body was found by a John A. Weber at 5 a.m., on April 29th, 1871, he was found close by his house in Springfield, Illinois, and his family was quickly told, ran out of the house, and his wife was weeping hysterically over his body as a group of onlookers thronged around. How because random. Because this is the late 19th century when shit like that happened. Um, Wait, Really? Oh yeah, like the 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 things that we're recording it off and like proper, you know, that was not the norm before like the twentieth century. Like pol- no. police didn't really do the same kind of stuff on a typical basis. But anyway, this was especially the true in this case because, like I said, it happened right outside his home. Um, Sharon um, had been planning to go on a visit. Uh, it's not really clear whether he was going to St. Louis or Belleville. Um, But either way, he was sort of sleeping lightly in the lounge in preparation for taking a really early train at 1.50 a.m. out of Springfield. And uh, he was last seen by his wife when Sharon came in to say goodbye to his wife. It's kind of sad, actually. I mean, he said, you know, basically, bye, don't, you know, need to get up, like, it's fine. I'm just going to go. I wanted you to know. So she went back to bed and was obviously awoken with the terrible news. And in the interim, it's supposed that a vagabond of some kind, you know, a rake, you know, some kind of assassin of some stripe or another, was awaiting Sharon's leaving of the house and intercepted him, the relatively well-to-do Sharon, on his way to the train, a distance of only a few blocks from his home. The killer seems to have sprung from behind a coal shed on the property and demanded money. Now, reportedly, Sharon wouldn't have taken very kindly to this kind of approach. Quote, those who were best acquainted with Mr. Tyndale know best that his answer would be such as would convince his assailant that force would be necessary to effect the object. Close quote. That's from an, that's from an old timey newspaper. That's why it's written like that. But essentially, How what that means is that he happened? would have stood his ground. We don't know exactly that this happened, but th- this is what likely happened. Okay. Um. So the unknown assailant, we we do kind of know this part of it that the unknown assailant bludgeoned Sharon on the left side of his head. Oh. Not a fatal wound though. Maybe enough to stun him. Maybe. Um. What really did Sharon in though was a gunshot straight to the back of his head. <gasps> Pointing upwards oh toward his god. left temple. Oh my god! So was that somebody in the war? Instant death. I mean, just no. But it was from point blank range too. Oh, wow. so it was like straight. And that's why some some people think there may have been two assailants because it may be. And and this is based partly on the the condition of the scene too, right? As you can imagine. And this that was actually described by Mr. Tyndale's son at the inquest that there were a number of tracks around. Before everyone kind of thronged around, oh. that everything was fucking destroyed because, again, not proper investigatory methods were used. Um, that it looked like there was a scuffle, right? And it wasn't clear how many footprints from how many people there really right, were, but but clearly there had been some kind of struggle, right? Oh wow! And then Le- Sharon was left laying face down with a gunshot to the back of his head, and the murder weapon sitting right next to him, which is kind of weird too. And yeah. what's also weird is although the robber or robbers had grabbed $50 that Sharon had on him, um, they left a few other small sums of money on his person and uh, the murder weapon, like I said. So it seems like they probably got spooked by something, maybe. That's... It, it apparently was a surprisingly um, happen in place for, uh, you know, well, one, you one, it... one o'clock in the morning because there were like five. a number of people who... 
No, the body wasn't found until five. But oh. this presumably happened around between one and two. There was a um, a night watchman several blocks away who described hearing a shot sometime between one or two a.m. Apparently, though, this was quite common in Springfield at this time, so he oh. thought nothing of it. Oh, no. I'm not sure why. Maybe there was a lot of hunting around. I don't know. I hope that that's the case. Maybe. But he apparently was not phased by hearing a gunshot at all. Oh, <laughs> that's what he told the inquest. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, there, okay, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there wasn't really much else that was found out. But... Um, there were these three mysterious ruffians who were seen in the vicinity Ruffians. that night. Yes, they apparently got onto a uh, like a streetcar with um, some more you know um, respectable people, I guess. Oh, who, they stood out. Yeah, who uh, they very much stood out. Um, they barely had enough to pay their fare. They were like talking low to each other, like whoosh, 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 like they were making plans or something. Ruffians. Um, Mr. Murder, Tyndale murder. happened to be on the car with them and they were kind of like pointing at him and stuff. So there's some evidence that they may have been involved. And it, it, again, it did seem from the physical evidence and the circumstance that there may have been more than one person. So it's pretty plausible. Rabble, rabble, rabble. But rabble. they were never found again and they left town that, that day. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Yeah, so it was just like, okay, maybe it was them, maybe it wasn't. There was also a, a man named Bernard Leesner who was briefly looked at. He happened to be seeing the sights in Springfield on his way to look for work in Quincy, Illinois, when he was briefly detained and questioned by the police. Um, and he happened to have the, a card with um, uh, Sharon Tinsdale's name, Tyndale's name oh. on it. And he, he had gone to the scene to see the body, but, I mean, so had a shit ton of other people. So he was questioned, his story panned out basically he said he had talked to a policeman the policeman said yeah that's what he told me so it seemed like okay it wasn't him so eventually the inquest jury ret returned a verdict of murder by person or persons unknown and a large sum you know was offered in reward by a, a group of prominent citizens for the arrest of whoever did this but nothing, nothing. was forthcoming and nothing ever came of it and it's been a cold case since you know, 1871, so... That's insane. And that's, those are the ones that are, like, no one's ever going to know. Well, we it's funny, because it just reminds me, we were talking earlier, before we started recording, about how we kind of want to do a special episode of, like, Solved Mysteries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, if y'all know of any murder mysteries that have been solved after a really long amount of time, like, email us, or, like, tweet at us, or, or put it on our Insta or something, um... Because uh, we, we want to do an episode coming up about that. So anyway, my sources are uh, Brooke Schweeters, uh, W-E-A-U, out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, Megan Good at the Charlie Project, APG Media Timeline. Uh, Robert M. Dudley at Spooner Advocate. Sonova Cantrell um, at the Sonova Inc. True Crime Blog. Wikipedia. Uh, the New Ooh. York Times Archive and the Illinois State Register Archive. Illinois State. Um, so... Yeah, um, like the state of Illinois, not like Illinois State University. Oh. But anyway, um, so yeah, so um, thanks for listening, you guys. Um, like I said, hit, hit us up on our social media, of, you know, stuff. Um, yep, Instagram, Facebook, it, Twitter. Yes. Just look at Patreon. You know, Patreon. Look at our Patreon. We uh, we have one extra segment up. We're gonna have another one up soon. So give us a dollar, you get that, and a sweet shout out. Um, and I am going to do some weird shit in the news. I, too, have weird shit in the news, Mario Silva. Weird shit in the news. Weird <laughs> shit in the news. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go first. Kenyans charged with imitating president to con businessmen. Our president? No, this is in Kenya. The Kenyan president. The Kenyan president, yeah, yeah. Um, a Kenyan court apparently has charged seven men for impersonating newly elected President Uhuru Kenyatta um, and swindling a prominent businessman out of 10 million shillings, which is apparently $100,000. Yikes. So, first of all, this is kind of disappointing to the people of Kenya and any you know person who would hope for good governance in Kenya because 
this essentially is a case of corruption, but the corruption didn't happen by a real politician. It was somebody impersonating yeah, what that the politician. Hell? So they these guys, right, who they're like, okay, we're going to do this thing, right, where we pretend to be a <laughs> okay, Rory Kenyatta okay. and get this fucking money. Okay, let's get this money. So they call this businessman up and they're like, hey, we'll sell you this land, wink, wink. If you give us this money, wink, wink, right? The oldest story in the book. And, um, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm the president. Like, let's do this deal, you know. I'm the president. It's like, you know, maybe hypothetically if a president were to, I don't know, own a hotel uh, in, like, the capital of the country maybe. And that president were then to, like, oh my God, have people Mario. go to that place and spend money. And it appears that maybe there was influence. I don't know. That's just a weird hypothetical. Something like that. Would it maybe happen in, a, like, a banana republic somewhere? Like. I don't know, America, President Trump, and Washington, D.C. It could. Could be. Maybe. Anyway. So, <laughs> rant. That was a rant. That was a yes. solid rant. Um, these guys, though, uh, did successfully carry out their scheme. They uh, made the call. Uh, uh, they apparently have sounded enough like Uhura Kenyatta to get away know, with it. I know. Like, that's um, what I was thinking about. I was like, they were successful? This, this businessman guy was, like, super gullible. And he would, he told his finance, the head of finance, he was like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, do it. Yeah, whatever. But we don't need to see a deed. No, it's fine. Just go ahead and give him the money. And uh, they rolled up in a bunch of fancy cars and uh, uh, took away the money and uh, then got arrested. So <laughs> didn't work out super well for them. But, um, yeah, it's uh, not, not a great story, but it is weird. It's kind of weird. I have a weird one. Go ahead. It's about sushi. Cool. And futurism. Oh, awesome. I know. I was gonna, I was like, Mario's I li- gonna... I like both those Mario things. Mario will be in. So, a Japanese company um, premiered at uh, South By, South By Southwest, mm-hmm. um, under the moniker Ooh, Sushi... Austin, Texas. Under the moniker Sushi Teleportation. <laughs> I know. Um, so, basically, it was... Um, this is where they had... 3D printed sushi. And they wanted to create the sushi by analyzing the saliva, urine, and stool of diners so that every piece is tailored to their needs. What? Which is weird because it's so sushi. Weird. Um, the, co- the whole concept is that they want like a system of robotic arms and 3D printers that are fed with bio data to create the sushi. So I don't really know what bio data is. Bio data. Uh, Don't look into that. I don't know. Um, It says that uh, they want biological samples. Okay. And they they want to create or they want to meet the nutritional requirements of the individual. Um, So it's trying to tailor it, especially to you, which (laughs) people are into that, I guess. Sure. But if you want, like, food inspired by your feces, like, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. sound that great, but So okay. if you do decide to go through with it, they send you a health test kit with vials, and you gotta mail them back, like, like, it says, um, you can mail back a vial of your waste. Uh, <laughs> Please, send us your waste. It's very weird. That is very weird. And here's some pictures of 3D huh. printed sushi. Okay. Well, um, that's it. That's just the episode. when you thought things couldn't get weirder, the Japanese come to the rescue. You know? The, the, <laughs> the Japanese, uh, I mean, you know, every culture's got a lot of weird in it, but uh, I feel like they maybe have more than their fair share, so I'm not sure. <laughs>